Hey everyone, welcome back to the Bravo Docket. We are going to jump right in to where we left off discussing the Marco Marco lawsuit. This episode, we're going to finish going through the allegations in the complaint. We're going to have to do a third episode where we go through Erica's response, the additional arguments, her assistance declarations, some exhibits. There's just so much more to get through. So let's dive in. All right. Next section, the inception of defendants Erica, Leia, and Mikey's uncharged co-conspirator Tom Girardi's malicious prosecution scheme was enabled by the Girardi's personal and financial relationship with defendant Secret Service agent Savage. Remember him? In or around November or December of 2016, at a time when her husband and his law firm were in dire financial straits. Erica falsely reported to the Secret Service through her husband's client, defendant Savage, that charges and transactions made to the Amex card by plaintiff and Marco Marco were not authorized and were fraudulent. None of the transactions made on the Amex card by plaintiff and or Marco Marco for purchases made by Erica were unauthorized or fraudulent. And defendant Girardi's contrary reports aided and abetted by defendant's Leia and Mikey to the Secret Service and Amex were knowingly false. So the complaint goes on and says, at all times relevant, Defendant Savage was the special agent in charge of the Los Angeles office of the United States Secret Service. Defendant Scarence was his assistant agent in charge of the Los Angeles office, and Defendant Henderson was a special agent working under Defendant Savage's and Scarence's direct supervision on the Erica Girardi fraud investigation. On information and belief, Agent Savage had a history in his former employment with the Secret Service of billing fake advanced presidential location scouting trips for which he was eventually involuntarily separated from the Secret Service during the investigation in this case. As a Secret Service agent, one of his duties was to scout locations for presidential trips to ensure the president's safety and security. On information and belief, Agent Savage falsely used his Secret Service credentials at luxury hotels and golf courses so he would receive free rooms, food, drinks, and free golf for himself and other Secret Service agents. He was caught and forced to leave the Secret Service, but this fact, which would negatively affect the credibility of the Secret Service investigation, was not disclosed to Chris, his counsel, or the grand jury during his criminal case. On information and belief, Tom and Savage knew each other for at least 10 years prior to 2016. Defendant Savage's wife's family knew Girardi and his law firm from decades earlier. Two of her relatives interned at Girardi Keys in the 90s. Tom Girardi and Savage socialized regularly, and Savage was an annual attendant at Girardi's Super Bowl parties. On information and belief, the Girardis, with the assistance of defendants Savage, Scrincy, Henderson, Leia, and Mikey, Amex, and Grimm, who's the Amex employee, concocted a false claim of criminal fraud so that the Girardis would extract a significant reimbursement from Amex. Prior to the indictment of Chris, the Girardis did in fact receive a reimbursement to which they were not entitled in the sum of $787,117.88. Defendant Erica Girardi received the goods and services from plaintiff and Marco Marco, and on top of it, a big check. That's insane. That is insane. That's yeah, because she was only complaining to the Secret Service about seven transactions. She complained about a lot more transactions, but the Secret Service asked for all of her stuff, obviously. She gave it to them, and then those seven transactions were the ones that they couldn't find. Well, he was charged on seven transactions, is what I'm trying to say. But then she got money oh, yeah, back yeah. for essentially almost all of the transactions, I guess minus those seven, from Amex, which is insane. I don't, I'm still confused about these numbers because... But not just that, but also the fact that they were able to get that much back from American Express. I don't know if you've ever tried to dispute a charge on your credit card. <laughs> I have. It is very difficult. <laughs> we'll go back to the timeline later, but we've got some specific details about what Erica gave to the Secret Service, what she supposedly told some of the Amex people, and the timeline of this supposed investigation. But we're just going to read from the complaint for now. In or about November or December 2016, Tom Girardi, borrowing heavily to fund his law firm, became upset about the Amex bill and Eric Girardi's charges to his credit card. Erica contacted defendant Savage, Tom Girardi's friend at the Secret Service, to assist with what she claimed were fraudulent charges by Marco Marco on her Amex card. On information and belief, Tom Girardi paid defendant Savage a bribe of at least $7,500 in order to ensure that the Girardi's 
received a fraudulent account credit slash refund from Amex. He bribed Defendant Savage through the guise of formally representing Defendant Savage in a lawsuit against Volkswagen. The joining of these two claims, one by Defendant Girardi against Chris to unjustly enrich herself and Tom Girardi, and one by Tom Girardi representing Defendant Savage in Savage's Volkswagen lawsuit is no coincidence. Are you still doing math? Yeah, I'm doing math. So, I mean, the amount she got back plus the seven charges that he was prosecuted for, it totals $850,000. But I guess the total of goods that she got from Marco Marco were 934. There's a little bit of a difference. When we go through the details of some of the supporting documents and affidavits and emails, and then secret service memorandums of interviews that were disclosed in discovery, you'll see that Erica claims that she doesn't know how or when she got this credit back to her card, or if she even got it, or what happened to it, or if she got it back in a check. She claims she doesn't know where close to $800,000 went. And she says that in pleadings, to the court that she signed. It's just crazy. Defendant Savage was a plaintiff in a lawsuit against Volkswagen concerning an alleged defective brake system in his Volkswagen minivan. Defendant Savage was already represented by counsel. Tom Girardi intervened in the lawsuit on Savage's behalf. Girardi contended in court the settlement offer to Savage of $7,500 was too small. Girardi accused Savage's Volkswagen counsel of deceit and that the lawyers had, quote, totally misled the Savage family during the litigation, which the lawyers denied, claiming an affidavit filed by Savage in the litigation was full of falsehoods. Agent Savage agreed to assist Erica Girardi and directed the agents underneath him to assist with the investigation. On December 7, 2016, Erica Girardi sent one of the defendant agents an email that on his advice, she had searched for additional Amex charges by Marco Marco, for the 2016 year, using additional search terms that doubled the number of charges and the charges she thought had got reversed were not. On December 13, 2016, Girardi appeared in court on behalf of Defendant Savage in the Volkswagen case. He attempted to persuade the court that the settlement was inadequate and that the Volkswagen lawyers had misled Savage. The court was displeased and angry with Girardi's last-minute intervention in a case where his settlement had already been reached, I can just imagine that judge, and expressed that to Mr. Girardi. In response, Tom Girardi told the court that the Savages would dismiss the case and Girardi would pay the couple 10 times the value of their settlement. If the court thinks I intentionally did something wrong or tried to do anything inappropriate, that doesn't work with me, so I would personally pay him $100,000. The next day, December 14th, 2016, Tom Girardi filed papers dismissing Agent Savage's claims against that Volkswagen. That makes no sense. I'm sorry. What? It makes no sense. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, in a footnote, plaintiff here says that he got this information from the LA Times article that we spoke about at the beginning of this episode. On the very same day when Tom Girardi dismissed the Volkswagen suit, the Secret Service defendants, as part of their bride and quid pro quo, Tom Girardi sent Erica Girardi wearing a hidden recorder to meet with plaintiff to discuss the Marco Marco Amex charges. Plaintiff Chris went into the meeting to clear up any misunderstandings concerning the Marco Marco charges and review each invoice with Ms. Girardi one by one. Since all the charges were authorized, he wanted to resolve any disagreement amicably. For him, he thought this might be based on some minor accounting issues or a communication problem. He saw this as a business dispute. The Secret Service agents and defendants Girardi, Leia, Mikey saw this as an opportunity to bully and cow Chris into agreeing he overcharged Erica. Erica extorted Chris into agreeing he might have mistakenly made some accounting errors. In an effort to placate her without admitting fault, he agreed he would do what it takes to make things right, even if that meant taking out a loan. But that was insufficient for Erica, who contended that he had overcharged her by eight hundred or nine hundred thousand dollars approximately the entire value of all the business they did in 2015 and 2016. In essence, without any proof, Erica went into that meeting and falsely attempted to extort and accuse Chris and Marco Marco of not providing any goods and services, when in fact, the facts demonstrate plaintiff provided Erica with all the goods and services he invoiced in 2015 and 2016. Can I just comment on that? As somebody who has had their own business that's a massive amount of money that this one client is purchasing in orders and designs and everything else, right? So you're going to want to make that client happy. You don't 
want to lose that business. And a lot of times, especially dealing with celebrities and whatnot, you have to sort of placate their egos or deal with that and you don't want to lose their business. And then also, Erica has a massive platform. And I would also assume that he would be terrified that she would get on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and turn this into a storyline or something, saying, I'm having all these issues with my costume designer or whatever. It's a massive platform that she has on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So there's a lot of reasons why you would want to placate this person who is ordering all of this stuff from your company. He was probably making orders for her and had to turn down other things. And so maybe even lost business from other people because he didn't have time to take on other clients. It makes sense to me. And I can totally see being in a meeting like that, thinking you're trying to resolve things and treating them like the customer's always right and saying things to placate them. Like, look, if there's a mistake, I'll fix it. I can see maybe there were some overcharges. Yeah, makes perfect sense. I mean, I just think it's ridiculous. She went in there and was like, you overcharged me by 800 or 900,000. That's the entire amount. (sighs) And another point, the fact that she turned all this stuff over to the Secret Service and then they only found seven charges just shows how honest this person actually was. Because if you have carte blanche to make all these things and do all these things, you could see how somebody might be like, oh, well, they won't notice. I will add this on there. It doesn't look like there's any evidence that he ever did any of that. And it's just a little ridiculous to go after him even if he did, for seven yeah. out of 132, come on. I know. It totaled, what did I say before, like $20,000 or something? No, it was more. Yeah. Like 40 or 50, it, but still. She's ordered $900,000 worth of stuff, and then there's 40000 or $50,000 in charges that they couldn't find receipts or invoices for, and so they're like, all right, put him in jail. That's crazy. I but, I mean, if someone does steal that amount of money from you, like, they should go to jail. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. In this context. Looking at the context. Yeah. (laughs) Defendant Erica Girardi ignoring all the costumes, designs, alterations, and services provided by Marco Marco and Chris in 2015 and 2016, as well as her performances and online images of their outfits, falsely accused plaintiff in the meeting of providing her nothing and that he had taken from her and Tom Girardi $800,000. Eight hundred thousand dollars. Should I try to do huh? an Eric? I mean, I think I could do an Erica. She goes like little Erica, million yeah. dollars. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, you do it. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> do you want me to read both? Okay. I'll, do, I'll read Chris. So I'll be, I'll be Chris. Eight hundred thousand dollars. Chris stated and added, "I don't know how that would even be possible." Girardi later in the conversation stated, "This is a million dollars. This is eight hundred, nine hundred thousand. Well, whatever. My husband's money. That's gone." <laughs> really good it's almost as good as ronnie (laughs) she told chris she went on to state you know all he's (laughs) that's really good (laughs) sometimes i can like channel the person like i feel it really good you know like i I know because you did really good when a paltrow and your dorit is really good too but go on wait wait okay she went on to state you know (laughs) you know I'm going to stop laughing. Okay, Okay, I'm going to hide so you can do it. She went on to state, you know, all he's Tom Durati, good to me. And all you've done is take my money. Do it one more time. You can do it. Okay. You know, no, she's not always that, you know. No, but that sounds, it's good. You know, all he's, (laughs) you know, all Tom Durati's is being good to me. And all you've done is take my money. There you go. (laughs) Insane. The evidence that will be produced in discovery that Chris possesses concerning the 132 Amex charges establishes that when Erica Girardi, aided and abetted by Leia and Mikey, said 800000 to 900000 was gone, Erica lied because Marco Marco and Chris have evidentiary backup in the form of invoices, text messages, emails, as well as photos and videos of Erica Girardi and her dancers wearing the costumes, proving the charges were legitimate and authorized. Exhibit one, reflecting the proof that Chris provided Erica Girardi, Leia, and Mikey costumes and services comprising the value and amount of the charges in the indictment is representative of the proof he has for each and every Amex charge. Erica recklessly made false accusations, clearly desperate about her and her husband's financial situation. So we have Exhibit 1, and it is very detailed, and there are screenshots of... Uh, oh, Ceci, do the do the Heather the <laughs> receipts timeline. 
But she do like it. screams. She's like, do it. Do the <laughs> receipts. <laughs> like, she's like, receipts. I don't know. She's like yelling. I can't do that. Receipts. Proof. Timeline. So it attaches exhibit one. And I love it when there's pictures and exhibits that are attached to complaints. And we have this here. And we will post portions of it on our Instagram. But it has screenshots of text messages. It's got invoices. It's got pictures of her performing, wearing the costumes. And it goes through and has evidence that he did all of this work for her. But it's not like all 132. No, but it's it, there's a lot. There's, what is it, like 15 pages or something? Yeah, but do you think those are just the seven? Oh, no, I think it's more than the seven. I, but, but he's saying it's, but you're right. I mean, he's saying it is representative of all the mm-hmm. evidence that they have. And when we go on to the details of this later on, so Leia, the assistant, has an affidavit where she says, I have reviewed the evidence that Chris has submitted. And she basically admits that he's right about a lot of it, but says that she didn't have copies of some of that stuff or whatever. So it's kind of defending herself. And we'll go into that in detail in another episode. We're now on to... So paragraph 53 talks about the recording where it says, the Secret Service agents without reasonable suspicion, let alone probable cause, and we'll get into all of that later when we talk about what a Bivens action is and how you make that. That'll be in a later episode. And Bivens actions are really hard to make, but they may actually have a pretty decent case here. They outfitted Erica with the covert recording device, which, by the way, we now know that is what she was talking about in that two truths and a lie game when she wore a wire. And that's just (laughs) she ruined this man's life for years and got him arrested and then is bragging about it. She thought it was cool. Cool to bring up in a game. That's not... It's not cool. So they outfitted Erica with a covert recording device in an attempt to entrap Chris into saying something incriminating. In fact, a careful review of the recording reveals nothing more than an innocent merchant attempting to follow a well-known rule of retail business. The customer is always right. Erica and her assistants later failed to review Chris's computer records or the phones, later seized pursuant to a search warrant and therefore in the possession of the Secret Service, or Erica's and her assistants text messages and emails on their phones and computers that would have corroborated that all the charges were legitimate. Another comment here, we're going to explain these legal claims in another episode and the proof that you have to have. But the fact that Erica and her assistants had the text messages in their possession, even if they didn't have all the invoices and had things showing that, hey, they did ask for this costume on this day, or hey, they did send an email requesting this alteration or whatever can be used as evidence of their alleged malice and intention to make these false claims against Marco Marco. Yeah, I mean, what I think he's what he's saying here is like, had they looked at all that, they would have seen the proof was all there. You guys asked for the right. stuff. I gave it to you. None of this was illegitimate. Even if they didn't intentionally do it, all they had to do was go back and look at their own text messages and emails. You know what I'm saying? Like all they had to do was look at the stuff in their own possession to verify the charges. Mm-hmm. And we have a copy of this and we'll talk about it in a later episode. Erica and her assistants and Defendant Savage emailed Defendant Grimm of Amex requesting a call to discuss the case. He's bringing this up because no one's explaining that the actual account holder is Tom Girardi. So he would be the actual victim in this because he's the one with the actual account. Okay, and then one point of correction here, this is editing Ceci right now, that we wanted to make from episode one. If you guys recall, Angela and I were going back and forth as to whether or not it was appropriate for that American Express employee to give Erica access to her account. And Angela was saying that she knows her own information, so she should have been able to answer the questions and just gotten access to the account. And I mentioned that she was holding a credit card account that belonged to Girardi Keys as a firm. Well, one of you guys emailed us, and thank you for emailing us and clarifying this. So this is a member of our legal team named Jane, and she emailed saying why Erica wouldn't have had access to the card. She says, hey guys, hopefully y'all see this, and if you do, that it's helpful. I used to work in banking and at one point worked directly for a credit card company. Not Amex, but they all follow the same privacy rules. The reason Erica wouldn't have been able to access account information despite knowing her basic security info is because she was an authorized user, not one of the account holders. Authorized users are authorized to charge to the account and have their own card with their own name printed on it. 
However, because they hold no legal responsibility for the account and are not an account owner, they cannot access information when they call in. In fact, you aren't even supposed to acknowledge to them that you can even tell that the account exists. It's similar to when someone has a beneficiary on a bank account in the sense that you can't tell them anything about anything. Legally, it's not their account, and they aren't liable for the debt. Usually authorized users are children whose parents have given them a card to use. Sometimes it's because one spouse has better credit, so the card is in their name with an authorized card for their partner. Or in the case of credit accounts for businesses, the owners on the account will usually be the decision makers with authorized cards for other employees. Given that her card was, if I recall correctly, a Girardi and Keese card, I, I think you're correct. My recollection is that it was a Girardi Keys credit card. It is kind of insane, that's on all caps, insane, she was given any info at all. Typically with business accounts, you do more verification. She gives an example, one bank I worked at, you verified four pieces of security info for personal accounts, but for business accounts, it was six. Honestly, if someone had randomly checked that call and heard that that employee gave her access, they probably would have been fired. Crazy risk to take for a call center employee. Anyway, hope this adds some clarity and wasn't too rambling. It was not too rambling. Thank you so much for this, Jane. So thanks for this context. And whichever Bravo fan was like, I recognize your voice from the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. That was that was not a, that was not a good move. That was not a good move. And now I feel even more confident that the reason Erica put anything about this at all in her declaration was because, again, she's trying to shift blame on Amex for giving the refund and showing that they're this company that skirts the rules a little bit in order to, again, shift the blame to them. I mean, I don't I don't think it's a very it's going to be a very successful argument because allegedly, according to this complaint, Erica had a really big involvement in getting the Secret Service to investigate this and had to provide them with evidence. So it wasn't Amex who was providing the Secret Service with evidence. Anyway, I'm so glad that one of you reached out to us about this clarification and that we could revise that information from the prior episode. Let's get back into it. And then they get the search warrant. And then they bring up the fact that Agent Henderson stated that fraudulent charges on the Amex totaled $801,013.63. And that Agent Henderson based this statement on Erica Girardi's review of the Amex statement in 2015 and 2016 and the report to him on the total of fraudulent charges based on Erica's statements to Agent Henderson that Marco Marco had been making repeated systematic unauthorized charges to Girardi's Amex account totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's how they got the search warrant to go and raid Marco Marco's business and take all of their computers, electronics, and phones. So just imagine going about your day and thinking that you've smoothed things over with Erica and then having the Secret Service come in and take everything you need to run your business and your phones and everything else. It's just awful. I mean, especially if the meeting went like he describes it in this complaint and he yeah. said, I made some basic accounting errors. I don't think he meant he made $800,000 worth of accounting errors. So then to just get a warrant based off of that is ridiculous. They have emails, text messages, receipts, timeline proof that they did request this stuff and that he did provide it to them. So think about the amount of power Erica is accustomed to feeling like she has. She can talk to Tom and allegedly get the Secret Service to go raid her designer's office if she complains about a bill. Yeah, that's Just, scary. Yeah. Chris, co-owner of Marco Marco, ended up being charged with the following, which Sessie's going to read from paragraph 88 of the complaint. So the indictment charged him with the following counts. Count one, using an unauthorized access device, the Amex credit card, with the intent to defraud in violation of a statute, federal statute, facing 10 years imprisonment. Counts two through eight were a scheme to defraud, wire fraud, victim, Erica Girardi, by means of material false and fraudulent pretenses, representations, and promises, and concealing material facts. And as a result of this scheme, Amex suffered losses in excess of $700,000 in violation of another federal statute facing 20 years on each count. And count nine, using the name of an American Express account number of victim Erica Girardi, without lawful authority in violation of another federal statute, carrying a mandatory consecutive two-year prison sentence. Therefore, oh my God. yeah, he was facing a maximum of 152 years in prison for a crime of which he was innocent. 
This caused him tremendous stress, psychological and physical damages, but he would not plead guilty to a crime he did not commit. So then I guess it wasn't just seven charges. It was for $700,000. Amex suffered losses of $700,000, but that's because Amex paid. That's a different thing. That's because Amex paid it back to Erica, not because he stole it. Well, isn't the implication that he stole it? Yeah, that goes into their conspiracy claim with Amex because they're saying Amex went ahead and refunded this, even though they Amex shouldn't have, because that allowed for a bigger charge against Chris. Mm-hmm. Editing Sussy here, I've since found the indictment. So this was issued February 2017 by a grand jury in the Central District of California. And count one is about knowingly and with the intent to defraud using an unauthorized device, which is the Amex card, to aggregate at least $1,000 during that period. Then there's counts two through eight. And this is all about that Sayla had a scheme to defraud. And because of his scheme to defraud, American Express lost in excess of $700,000. So they put $700,000. I think that's just because of the statute. But like we said before, Amex actually refunded Erica more than $700,000. I think it was over $800,000. And then the seven credit card charges that we keep bringing up are brought in because they want to say that he, by transmission of wire communication in interstate foreign commerce, charged her Amex card without authorization for these seven charges. So the bigger piece of this is Amex refunding the money more so than Erica's charges. I don't want to downplay Erica's role here. It it is all intertwined, but I initially thought that she allegedly had him indicted because of all of the charges, not just the seven. But it's all intertwined because had she not been fraudulently charged, like this indictment alludes to, had Selah not fraudulently charged, I'm doing air quotes, Erica over $900,000 or $800,000, then Amex would have never refunded Erica that money. And he wouldn't have, quote, defrauded Amex by virtue of her having to do the chargeback. Does this make sense? I hope everyone's following along. And then there's account nine, which says that he knowingly possessed and used without lawful author- authority a means of identification that defendant Sela knew belonged to another person, namely the Amex account number of victim Erica Girardi. I can post screenshots of this to our Instagram and our Patreon just to make it a little bit clearer. So there's seven specific charges at issue here, but there's still the multiple charges that made up the $700,000 plus that Amex refunded to Erica. Yeah, I guess if the Amex refund hadn't happened, then it would have just been the smaller number of charges. Let's talk about Amex's role in this or his allegations. It's paragraph 92, like what, what he alleges they didn't do. We'll get into this when we go through the Secret Service memorandums of interview that were produced that we have from the legal files. But essentially, he states in the complaint that prior to the refund made to the Girardis by American Express, neither American Express nor the American Express employee Grimm conducted any investigation that complied with American Express standards for determining whether fraud occurred in a credit card transaction. They did not interview Chris or any employees of Marco Marco, including co-owner Marco Marante, who designed and supplied the costumes. They did not review their own history with Marco Marco and Chris would have revealed a track record of thousands of legitimate transactions and only two chargebacks in all that time. They did not request any documentation from Chris to dispute the charges of fraud by defendants, and they did not tell Chris that they were going to refund Tom Girardi $787,117.88. They did not attempt to collect that money from Chris or charge back his merchant's account, and Chris is informed and believed that they failed to inform the Secret Service agents that they were not seeking money from Chris. And looking at the actual documentation, this does seem to be substantiated by what has been put out in the record. I don't know how that works. I've had very good dealings with American Express. I would say of all my credit cards that I've had, I have had the best experience with them, but this is unusual. Erica's saying she doesn't even know that she got the $800,000 or where it went 
one of Erica's declarations that we'll get into later says, I was unable to get in touch with Peter Grimm until January 2017. And Grimm is the American Express employee. She said, I do not recall what documents I shared with Peter Grimm. I do not know when or how American Express provided a refund. I never received any checks directly. I do not know whether I received a credit from American Express in my credit card account. How do you not know? Because it went to Tom. That you have $700,000 in your account. Because it went but to it Tom. Went, <laughs> she doesn't check it. Yeah. It went to Tom. I guess. But she she has access to it since she started this. Yeah, but she's, she's not looking she at it. She had access to it in 2017. The U.S. Attorney's Office, who was prosecuting this, dismissed the case. They did not say really why they were dismissing the case. And eventually it came out that there was a sort of a lack of evidence or an unsubstantiated investigation. And because these charges were dropped, he had the ability to bring this civil lawsuit. So, I mean, he was never found guilty because it was dismissed. He was never yeah, sentenced, they, but he had to go through many years of defending himself. Yeah, it's absolutely awful. And then wasn't there a statement by in the Hulu documentary by the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Secret Service? I think they reached out and they said they weren't going to make a statement. Or they weren't going to comment on it. And that it was just dismissed, but I'll go back and look. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they like said something. And Amex, they got statements from both of them. Amex just said it followed their normal procedures. I remember that. Mm. Okay, so I went back and watched the documentary. So this is what was said. The U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Secret Service declined to comment for the documentary. An attorney... For Robert Savage, who was the Secret Service head at the time, said Mr. Sela's lawsuit against Mr. Savage is meritless. The United States Attorney's Office decided to pursue criminal charges against Mr. Sela. Mr. Savage played no role in directing the investigation. American Express did refund the $787,000 to Girardi. The company, so Amex, issued a statement saying, in part, We followed our regular processes and procedures throughout this investigation. We did not play a role in the criminal investigation of Mr. Sela or his business other than responding to inquiries from law enforcement. All right, so everyone's just washing their hands of this. Washing their hands. Nothing was done wrong. We've pretty much gone through the facts that were alleged in the complaint. As you've probably seen on social media Erica has filed multiple motions attempting to get this dismissed, and it hasn't worked, including an anti-slap motion. And there's even more details and receipts, proof, and timeline from both sides in there. So in the next episode, we will go through the procedural aspects of the case, which are actually pretty interesting, and the legal claims and what Marco Marco will have to prove and the standards for that, which are Also, I mean, honestly, trying to sue the federal government is really difficult. And so it's fascinating to find a case where this could actually work out. American Express has tried to get this case in arbitration, and that hasn't worked. Basically, this judge has shut down every attempt to get this out and for solid basis. So we'll talk about all of that, and you'll get to learn all kinds of really interesting things. And we have more receipts, proof, and timeline for you. There's a lot of stuff in here. Many timelines. Receipts, proof, timeline, timeline, timeline. Well, thanks, legal team.